<laughs> Welcome uh, everyone to the virtual seminar mm -hmm. in economic theory. Today we are happy to have uh, Arjada Bardi from Duke University who will present the paper uh, Local Evidence and Diversity in Mini Publics. This is a joint work with uh, Nina Bobkova, who is also present today with us. Uh, we also have as guest panelist, Stephen Callender from Stanford Graduate School of Business. And on this occasion, and due to his interest and expertise on the topic, our colleague and co-organizer, Mas Kuyek, uh, will act as a panelist. The format is, as usual, a 60-minute presentation followed by a 15-minute Q&A session. And during the talk, we encourage you to post comments and, and questions in the QA section on Zoom. Nina will answer clarifying questions in writing and may answer more substantive uh, ones live. The talk is going to be recorded. Next week, we will have Franci Francisco Poggi from Northwestern University giving a presentation, The Timing of Complementary Innovations. And our guest panelists will be Chio Shen Mu and uh, Jorge Lemus. Arjada, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Uh, the micro and the screen are all yours. Thank you, Angel. Uh, and thank you to everyone who is tuning in, tuning in this morning. Um, and thanks to Steve and Max for, for being here and joining the discussion. Um, so this is recent work with Tina. Um, so to motivate the motivating phenomenon that's at the center of this project is a novel democratic mechanism that is usually known as uh, mini public, sometimes referred to as also as citizens assemblies or citizens convention. It's recently attracting a lot of attention as a way to engage citizens in um, meaningful and direct ways into public policy making. In a moment, I'll give a concrete example of a recent mini public. But uh, the basic idea is simple. It was first uh, formulated by Robert Dahl, political scientist Robert Dahl in the, in the 80s. Dahl called these originally mini populous. So these would be an assembly of citizens selected to be demographically representative of the large population, but small relative to the, to the large population. The main task of which would be to spend substantial time getting informed about an issue of public interest and then pronounce its recommendation to those in charge of these decisions, typically policymakers. Now, why would we need such a mechanism? That's the first sort of natural question uh, once we, once we uh, uh, sort of uh, see this, this new concept. Uh, well, the premise behind the proposal is that in modern societies, which are large and heterogeneous, public policymaking is complex and often has to rely on information that only the citizens, ordinary citizens can access. Lay citizens might have privileged insight into how the policy is likely to affect them and others of a similar background. Uh, so uh, a classic argument in political economy tells us that um, uh, typically voters in large elections are likely to remain uh, rationally ignorant if, uh, if they... Uh, uh, because they, they're, they're, uh, the probability of them be being pivotal in this large election is small, and so they, they will choose to, to, to uh, remain uninformed about, uh, uh, about the, the policies. Um, Ariadne, can I ask, your yeah. slides aren't updating on my screen. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Sorry. Are, let me see, are they or are they yep. now? No, they are now, sorry. I thought you were already on the first slide and they weren't updating. Go for it. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the rational ignorance was first formulated, as we know, by Downs and Schumpeter and uh, later formalized by Mar Martinelli. Um, so mini publics are essentially proposed as a way out of rational ignorance. It's a way to restore such incentives for information acquisition in elections and act as an information proxy for the large society. So the fundamental question that, um, that, that we, we, we sort of have to address in, in, uh, in this context is how do citizens get selected into the mini public? Which social groups should be the ones that, uh, that get represented in these small groups? Uh, so I'll, I'll give uh, the, the promised example in a moment, but uh, let me try to uh, formulate the, 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 the problem of mini public in, in precise terms and in how we, we formulate it in this paper. Um, so we formulate this problem as one of sampling citizens out of a large citizenry. Uh, so we think of this as a setting in which citizens are being selected from a large citizenry. Um, uh, mini public citizens will produce evidence uh, for a policymaker. Uh, each citizen will choose 
whether to produce his local evidence. We'll think of local evidence in this context as correlated across citizens. So citizens of similar backgrounds are likely to have more correlated evidence. The policymaker will observe the local evidence that is acquired and will make a policy decision based on the produced evidence. And ultimately, uh, the, the driving force of, of this uh, setting will be one in which um, the mini public will face uncertainty about the threshold that the policymaker is choosing to make the decision based on the produced evidence. So thinking about the, uh, the setting of, of a large citizenry uh, in these visual terms here, uh, thinking about citizens as lining up in a line according to some observable characteristics, uh, a mini public is a selection out of the citizenry. So here I'm denoting the uh, mini public citizens that have been selected into the mini public by black dots. Among those mini public citizens, uh, the, the only a subset of those will be producing evidence and those are denoted here uh, with the red dots. So only the red dots here uh, are, are the ones who are producing their local evidence. So uh, this is the formal problem. Now, let me come back to a timely example of a mini public, um, the Citizens Climate Convention uh, that, that has just concluded its, uh, 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 its mission in France and the recommendations of which are currently being debated in the National Assembly in France. Um, in a nutshell, uh, President Emmanuel Macron proposed the idea of a Citizens Assembly as a response to the Yellow Vest movement uh, in 2019 and in the context of the grand national debate there. Um, this uh, Citizens Convention consisted of 150 randomly selected ordinary citizens called upon to formulate concrete recommendations on France's climate policy for the next decades. So the convention worked from October 2019 to June 2020. It issued 149 specific recommendations that were delivered to Macron in June 2020. Uh, of course, the, the, uh, the lockdown affected its proceedings, so it was delayed uh, in its recommendations because of the uh, uncertainty that we all uh, that they experienced at the time. Um, so. In their own words, the way in which this Citizens Convention describes itself, and this is coming, this is a quote from the from the from their website, uh, they think of themselves not as an assembly of specialists. The participants come from all backgrounds, and the ultimate goal of the Citizens Convention is to um, to bring uh, for each citizen to bring their own daily expertise into the issue, and its diversity to reflect the diversity of the large French society. So issues of representation are very important in this uh, when, when, uh, when selecting such a citizens convention. Now, a notable feature of the convention, and we argue more generally of mini publics, is the presence of, uh, of uh, political uncertainty regarding the extent to which the recommendations will be taken up, in, in this case, by Macron. So uh, initially, Macron pledged to forward recommendations without filter to either the parliament or to a large referendum. Uh, of course, that did not uh, happen. So now that we're sort of uh, more than a year from, from that promise, um, only 46 recommendations made it into the climate and resilience bill. So Macron walked back on that promise uh, gradually. And there is general dissatisfaction with the way in which the recommendations have been taken up uh, by the, by the uh, uh, president, last month, the members of the convention gathered to rate the government's responsiveness to the recommendations, and they essentially gave a score of 3.5 out of 10 to Macron. So there, there is general dissatisfaction with the impact that the recommendations have had on the, on the climate policy. Um, now, to fix ideas, there are uh, a number of features that, uh, that we think are important when somebody tries to model mini publics. So let me lay those uh, specifically. So uh, first, um, we think of mini publics as a microcosm of the large citizenry. Uh, so while small, they have the capacity to be, to be informative about the outcomes of the policy for the large, uh, for the large citizenry. Uh, second, we think of mini publics as relying on targeted recruitments of ordinary citizens. So what I mean by targeted is that citizens have to be selected into the mini public. They cannot be self-selected into it, neither can they be uh, elected into the mini public. Uh, third, uh, most mini publics uh, that, that we've seen implemented have a strictly advisory role, so they don't have decision, decisional authority over the public policies that are being discussed. 
Um, certainly, uh, an implication of this is that there is uncertainty about the extent to which the mini public's evidence and recommendation will be taken into account by those with the decisional authority. And lastly, we are thinking of mini publics as a mechanism for uh, producing public knowledge rather than aggregating already existing private knowledge. Uh, so thinking back to the convention, the Citizens Convention in France, citizens who come in are hardly informed about climate policy. Uh, they figure out how likely they are to be, to be affected by different uh, uh, climate policies while they are in the mini public. And this is precisely what we try to capture in this model. So um, in this way, we are abstracting away from issues of deliberation, which have attracted a lot of attention on the literature on mini publics, a very interesting topic, but not one that we're getting into uh, today. Um, so the questions that we that uh, that are driving this this project are essentially two. So on the evidence production side, we try to understand how does political uncertainty affect citizens' incentives to contrib contribute their local evidence into the mini public. And then once we've answered this question on the mini public design question, we try to understand to what extent is the optimal mini public representative of the large citizenry, to what extent it can be representative. Uh, so uh, the, the basic force in, in the model that I'm going to show you today is a tension between how likely the recommendations of the mini public are to be uh, taken up by the policymaker versus how representative the mini public is. So we want to make the argument that if the mini public has a weaker say on the final decision, then uh, it's hard to motivate very representative mini publics to, to, to acquire evidence. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you haven't seen the model yet, so perhaps it's a bit vague to talk about takeaways, but let me just give you a sense of what we find. Uh, so we show that political uncertainty can be detrimental to the production of evidence, even if the conditions for, for uh, the, the other circumstances in, in this setting are such that they're conducive of more information, not less information. So we assume that the policymaker and the citizens agree ex ante on the decision threshold. So there is ex ante agreement but, uh, between them. Citizens are civic minded, so they evaluate the, the policy based on the public good and evidence is costless and transparent. So even though all of these things are in place, we show that political uncertainty can be detrimental to evidence production. Um, and perhaps quite surprisingly, we show that what hampers political, uh, uh, what hampers evidence discovery is the presence of moderate rather than high political uncertainty. Then on the mini public composition side, we show that the optimal mini public is too non-diverse, so it's of low diversity, uh, and we offer two notions of diversity uh, to, to formalize this claim, uh, a notion of informational diversity, and uh, Very after... Uh, okay. Are, can everyone see my slides? Yeah, yes. they're just a bit slow to update sometimes when you... Oh, I see. Go and click on them or something like that. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I think I'm clicking on the right time, but, uh, and it's updating here on, okay. I'll, I'll keep an eye, but please flag it to me if, if it's not uh, reflecting the most correct, the most up-to-date slide as I'm talking about them. Is it too much of a lag for me to, to sort of continue in this way? Should I perhaps switch to another form of uh, I think we should keep as it goes, and, and okay. yeah, I mean, we'll try to keep an eye on the on the clicks, okay. And if we see that it's delay, we we'll let you know. No, Arjana, okay. Alternatively, you. you just get out of uh, full screen and try to go with that. That should. Uh, that should so I'm, I'm currently on an iPad, so I'm not sure that full uh, screen okay. is what you. Yeah. yeah, never mind. So. Uh, as I was saying, the, the, we offer two notions of diversity, informational diversity and demographic diversity, and we show that the optimal mini public is of low diversity in both, according to both of these notions. And um, what this means is essentially that citizens around the median citizen will be too uh, overrepresented, whereas those in the margins will be too underrepresented. Um, let's go to the model, unless there are any questions. 
So in this model, we'll have a single policymaker and the unit mass of citizens. Uh, the citizens here are lined up in the unit interval 0, 1, and they're indexed by I. A mini public will consist of uh, distinct citizens that will denote by, uh, by M. Uh, so this is the notation that we use for a mini public. And citizens, we, we assume, are ordered from left to right. So here I'm giving an example of a three citizen mini public uh, where I1 is the leftmost citizen and I3 is the rightmost citizen. Now, a mini public can, we'll assume can accommodate at most n citizens. So we'll refer to this as mini public capacity. This is the maximum number of citizens that can be uh, accommodated. And MN will be the set of all mini publics of size at most n. The policy uh, that is up for evaluation by this policymaker and the, uh, the, the citizens is uncertain. Uh, the decision that will be made on this policy is a binary decision, either to adopt the policy or not. Now, the policy outcomes here will vary across citizens. So this will be a, a sort of a rich policy in terms of outcomes. We'll denote this policy uh, outcomes by beta. So beta is a function that takes all citizens as, uh, uh, in, the, in the domain and produces a real outcome. So beta i will be the realized policy outcome for citizen i. Now we'll assume that each outcome beta i is uh, ex ante equally uncertain. So all policy outcomes for all citizens are ex ante of the same variance. Now for any two citizens i and j, the outcomes beta i and beta j are correlated, and this correlation structure is common knowledge. So for now, uh, you should be thinking of a policy outcome that is a function that's realized, uh, but nobody is able to observe. Uh, we can only learn about this function through the mini public. Now, let me put a bit more structure on the correlation between policy outcomes of different citizens. So we'll assume that this outcome mapping beta is drawn from the sample paths of a non Schindler-Weg process on zero one, where two conditions are met. So first, the uh, uh, outcome of citizen i is normally distributed with mean beta bar i and variance one. So this is what I refer to as the unit variance for all citizens. Their outcomes are equally uncertain. And more importantly, the correlation between any two citizens i and j, the correlation between their outcome is given by this exponential form. Note that in this exponential form, the correlation depends only on the distance between i and j and the parameter l. So let me give you a picture. Um, the, uh, in the x-axis here, we have citizens from zero to one. On the y-axis, we have policy outcomes. Um, Following with the, uh, with the example of a three citizen mini public, we have I1, I2, and I3, three citizens that we've picked. Now the gray mapping here is the policy outcome that has been realized. This is one particular sample path of this process. Um, whereas the beta bar I is the expected outcome for everyone. So in this example, I'm assuming that everyone has the same expected outcome to start with. And for the rest of the talk, this is the picture that you might want to keep in your mind as well. This will be uh, inessential for the results as we go on. Now, uh, the correlation parameter L uh, is, uh, in fact, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, parameter for us uh, because it captures the degree of heterogeneity among citizens. So this L parameterizes how correlated the outcomes are across a fixed distance. So as L is going to plus infinity, outcomes become almost perfectly correlated. This is the case of a citizenry that's very homogeneous and experiences very similar outcomes from the policy. As L goes to zero, uh, the outcomes will become almost independent. This is the case of a a, a very heterogeneous citizenry, one in which the outcomes are uh, very a lot. Uh, crucially for us, this correlation structure is one that depends only on distance. So just to, to, to repeat, uh, the uh, correlation here depends only on the distance between any two citizens. So it's capturing the notion of sort of similarity of backgrounds of different citizens. Ariada, I really, yeah. Ariada, can I ask a question? 
Just yes, back to the previous slide. So I really, I really like this structure uh, and and what it captures. Can, are there any particular kind of issues or what kind of relationship in the society should we be thinking out about? And that there's no sort of in some of my work, I have this linear structure, sort of an underlying yes. force throughout it, whereas this is mean reversion, which I think is very nice. What kind of issues should we be thinking of here? Thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent question. So let me uh, give you a finite citizenry sort of analog to this process, perhaps to, to highlight what is nice about this process. And then I'll come back to, to what might be issues with the process. So um, the Orshan Unionberg process is the limit of a very simple structure when we're thinking about finitely many citizens. So continue to think of my circles example that I gave you in the introduction. Citizens are circles sort of put in a, in a line. If we think about any two adjacent citizens as having a correlation row between their outcomes, then uh, this would be the, the finite citizenry counterpart of the Ornstein Lübeck. So it's capturing a very sort of natural idea in which I'm more closely correlated with those citizens that are close to me, but as citizens go further away, I'm less correlated. Uh, with them. Uh, for those of you who are perhaps thinking this is a, in, in formal terms, this is a, a, a stationary AR1 process that is sort of the, the discrete analog of the Ornstein Unionbeck here. Um, so what we like about this process is the fact that it depends only on, the correlation depends only on distance, and it allows us to have citizens who face the same uncertainty ex ante. So when we're sampling citizens in the, in the setup, we're not sampling them because they have more or less variable outcomes to start with, or sampling them precisely because of the position that they have in the citizenry. So uh, the, the two features that I have here as one and two are the features that we like about this process. Of course, as you mentioned, Steve, this comes uh, sort of the exponential form that we have here is less tractable than what a linear structure would, would be. Uh, for So I'll highlight towards the end of the talk as we go into demographic diversity, where the exponential structure sort of gives us a hard time uh, in terms of generalization. Um, the uh, I would have very much liked to have a correlation structure here that perhaps is more linear in structure while keeping the equal variance of outcomes uh, in, the, in, the, in the setup. But uh, I'm not aware of a, of a correlation structure that sort of nicely does this within the class of housing processes. All right, great, very nice. Thank you for the question. So let's go to actions and strategies here. So the game, game will proceed into uh, three stages. So first, there will be a mini public choice. So the policymaker will choose a lottery over mini publics of size at most n. And each citizen will observe the entire mini public. Uh, so each citizen who comes in observes the entire n. The second stage is evidence discovery. Um, so each citizen in the mini public can costlessly and publicly discover their outcome beta i. All evidence discovered in this mini public will be simultaneous. And moreover, if a citizen is in the mini public does discover his evidence will say that he is active. If he does not discover the evidence will say that he is passive. Okay. The third, uh, uh, stage here will be policy adoption. So now that the mini public has collected the evidence, the policymaker observes all the produced evidence, all the discovered evidence. The policymaker will also draw a threshold of adoption that I'm about to, to explain in a moment. And based on this information, she'll decide between the policy and the status quo. So in terms of timing, the outcome mapping is realized first. Then the policymaker will choose a mini public. So um, once the mini public is set up, everyone will come into the mini public, see who else is in the mini public and decide whether to be active. So uh, citizens in the mini public will decide whether to discover evidence. The uh, outcomes of those who have decided to, to be active will be uh, observed. The policymaker will draw a threshold of adoption and ultimately a decision will be made. Can I uh, ask a question here? Yes, please. So, so this is um, this mini public is we shouldn't think about this necessarily as a as a committee in a conventional sense. It doesn't have any rules, voting rules inside that decide about the the recommendation because it's just the advice. This is just a set of advisors. Precisely. So there is uh, here all the evidence that's discovered within the mini public 
is perfectly observed by the, by the policymakers. So there is no aggregation step in which the evidence that has been produced is being translated into perhaps a single recommendation that is then passed to the policymaker. So we're trying to, to make this as, uh, to make the policymaker here be as informed as, as, as possible. So, so in fact, uh, this, this mini public doesn't even have to meet in one place. Uh, once the, it is announced, um, the the policymaker can just uh, meet with them individually in, in, in a sequence and collect the discovered information. So uh, in terms of the uh, whether they have to meet, um, it's, it's sort of crucial for our results that uh, for, for one of our results, and I'll flag this, uh, for everyone to be able to, to, to be aware who else is in the mini public. Uh, so in that sense, if you're thinking of meeting as observing qualities in the mini public, then that's important. Um, the sequential structure that you that you are sort of thinking of is something that's quite interesting to us. But uh, for now, we are thinking just of simultaneous discovery and uh, the citizens not uh, not being able to sort of do do uh, calculus based on qualities. Well, just with the with the with the policymaker. So so I see. they don't know each other's uh, discoveries. They just go to the to the room with the you know with Macron and talk individually with him. Right. Yes, we're thinking of it for ultimately as them coming into the mini public, seeing who else is there, and because of all the expertise and the time that they take within the mini public, they're able to discover these beta eyes. Uh, in in this scenario, so that you have in mind, perhaps the the mini public citizens would need to to have that kind of exposure to information sources that would allow them to to learn how the public policy will affect them. Um, so this is the reduced form uh, assumption that we're capturing here in this simple structure. Uh, that there is information that the mini public citizens are are sort of exposed to when they come into the mini public that they that makes it able for them to to understand how the policy will affect them. Thanks. Thank you. Can uh, so the the threshold is chosen independently of of the policy outcome realization. Let so, me get to that in a moment. Okay. Yes, I haven't talked about the the distribution of the threshold yet. No, no, I'm doing it. Ah, oh, sorry. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah, because I was thinking because there, there could be some strategizing in terms of. Um, from the part of the citizens in terms of uh, choosing the the threshold together with the with the policymaker right which could be a function either of the policy outcome or the prior with which they enter the, the citizenship yeah that's uh so uh let me let me get right to yeah, the payoffs okay, okay. so that we can see the structure and sort of uh, uh address your question as well uh so um both the policymaker and the mini public citizens here will care about the average outcome of the policy um, the common good, so they care about the, uh, the, the overall population-wide effects of the policy. And the simple way in which we'll, uh, we'll have this structure is that the true value of the policy is the sum of all the outcomes across the entire citizenry, which of course, because of the uh, Gaussian structure that we have here in terms of outcomes, is also Gaussian with some uh, expected um, uh, value B bar which aggregates all the expected outcomes across the entire citizenry and some variance sigma bar uh, infinity, which, uh, which is not uh, essential for now to unpack. Now, each mini public citizen will obtain the true value of the policy if the policy is adopted and zero otherwise. Whereas the policymaker will obtain the true value of the policy minus a threshold from adoption and zero otherwise. Now, uh, let's, let's see what this threshold of adoption, where is it coming from? Uh, so the threshold of adoption is drawn from uh, a Gaussian distribu distribution with mean zero and various uh, tau, tau squared. So the, the zero mean here is trying to capture the idea that the policymaker has uh, in expected terms, a threshold of zero. So the policymaker is ex ante aligned with the citizens. The tau squared for us is a measure of political uncertainty. So the more, the higher tau squared is, the more variable the, the threshold is, and the more unpredictable is the policymaker's decision 
based on any given amount of evidence. So tau squared here is trying to capture the, uh, the uh, sort of uh, notion of political uncertainty. Now, as you see here, Miltosh, uh, the, um, uh, this distribution of, of the threshold is exogenous. So the, the citizens are not choosing the threshold. They're rather sort of, they know this distribution and they're taking it as given that the policymaker will draw such a threshold after they provide their evidence. Now, crucially, in terms of the timing, C is realized after the evidence is discovered, but before the adoption decision. And B bar here, in absolute terms, will be a measure of the policy sentiment. Well, th this will be a bit uh, sort of, we won't talk much about this today. So, uh, but I'm happy to talk about it in the, in the discussion. So, um, let me be brief in terms of the related work. Uh, we are, uh, the, the problem that we have here is um, fundamentally a problem of uh, information design, uh, but the sort of a two layer information design. On the one hand, the policymaker is uh, deciding about an information structure when she chooses a mini public uh, that will, that will uh, discover evidence about the policy. On the citizen side, the citizens are also making uh, sort of uh, choosing an information structure when, when they decide whether to uh, have uh, uh, to perfectly uh, discover their own outcome or to discover nothing at all. So they're also choosing between a perfectly informative information structure about their outcome or a perfectly uninformative one. Uh, because of our interest in correlated outcomes across citizens, the uh, the uh, the paper is related to to uh, recent work on uh, selective learning among multiple correlated information sources. I believe Annie uh, a few weeks ago presented in, in this very same seminar, her paper, her very nice paper on correlated information sources. Um, the, uh, there are similarities to, to uh, the literature on team design and committee design as it has come up a little bit here as well, uh, but our focus is quite different from these literatures. Um, in terms of the methodology or uh, the, the way in which we are modeling the correlated outcomes across citizens, uh, the framework here is inspired and in building up on a literature uh, that uses Gaussian processes to model such correlated information sources. And uh, Steve has been uh, sort of a substantial, have, has substantially contributed to, to, to this literature in the last decade. Um, the, uh, Finally, I should say that there is a large literature of mini publics outside of the uh, economics literature. The, uh, within economics, um, the, the uh, attention has been uh, sparse to this question, but Max has a very nice uh, recent paper uh, looking at uh, uh, the comparison between representative, uh, representative system and citizen assemblies and in terms of information acquisition and trying to explain which one might be the better choice. Um, uh, so our focus here in contrast is on mini public composition. So, so it's a bit of a different focus, um, but we like to think of it as a complementary focus. So here's my plan for the rest of today. I will first simplify the policymaker's problem and show that it takes a very tractable form. Then I'll briefly tell you about the first best mini public. And after we've done that, we'll go into the optimal mini public and we'll argue that uh, the uh, policymaker does not distort the mini public size. It, he, uh, she actually distorts only the composition of the mini public and we'll look into the precise form that such a mini public takes. So let's fix a mini public M and let's suppose that the citizens are following a certain evidence discovery strategy delta I uh, for all I in M. This will induce a lottery over uh, subsets of mini public citizens who decide to be active. I'll refer to these as active mini publics. So M hat here denotes the subset of active citizens within the mini public. Of course, this will lead to realized outcomes beta of M hat. Now the players will update from the prior value for the policy, B bar, to a post mini public value of the policy that will essentially be the expected value of the integral uh, of all, uh, of all uh, realized outcomes across the entire citizenry, knowing that we have observed the outcomes of M hat. Okay. Now um, this, uh, this post mini public value uh, is also Gaussian because the outcomes of all citizens are Gaussian. 
And more importantly, it's a Gaussian with a mean that does not depend on the active mini public that we're looking at. So the mean of this Gaussian distribution, distribution is B bar. The variance of this Gaussian distribution tells us how variable the post-mini-public post value is, in other terms, how informative the, 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 the mini-public M hat is. So thinking about this for a second, the higher the variance of this post-mini-public value, the more information is realized about the policy. So the residual uncertainty that remains about the policy is lower. Okay? So that's why we refer to sigma squared M hat as a measure of informativeness of the mini public. Now, a key observation in the setup is that the player's payoffs will depend on the active mini public only through this informativeness measure, measure. So this will be very important for us. Now, let's write down the expected payoffs of the policymaker and the citizens. You should be expecting at this point that those payoffs will be of the form, the payoff, uh, taking as an argument the informativeness of the mini public. Now, the policymaker will adopt the policy if and only if the post mini public value is greater than the threshold that, uh, that she has obtained. So, in terms of writing this out, uh, because the, uh, the value of the status quo is zero, uh, she only needs to take into account the expected value of the policy that is adopted. So, this is the probability that the policy is adopted. And this is the expected value of an adopted policy for the policymaker. Notice here that she takes uh, the, the, the post mini public value of the policy minus the threshold that she has, uh, that she has obtained. And of course, we are uh, sort of averaging this out across all possible values of the threshold in order to compute the expected payoff of the policymaker. Now, this takes a very nice form, and we're able to, uh, to observe that the policymaker's expected payoff is strictly increasing in uh, informativeness sigma squared. So the policymaker's problem is a problem of prediction. The policymaker is trying to best predict whether adoption is a good idea. Uh, so she's trying to, to predict whether the true value is above the, the threshold C. For any C, Higher mini public informativeness means better prediction, which means a more accurate adoption decision. Uh, so, for any given C, a more informative mini public will be preferred. Of course, this means that in expected terms, taking the expectation over all Cs, uh, a, a more informative uh, mini public is always better for the policymaker. So, the policymaker here will be maximizing the informativeness of the mini public. Mini public. On the citizen side, Doing the same exercise, um, the, uh, we can write down the payoff of the citizens. So uh, again, we have the probability of adoption, the probability that the post mini public value is greater than C. And we also need to take into account the expected value of the policy that is adopted conditional on adoption. Now, differently from the policymaker, the citizen here has only takes only the expectation of the post mini public value because she does not internalize the threshold of adoption C. So this is the main friction between the citizens and the policymaker. Averaging this all out across all possible Cs that can be realized, we have this form for the for the citizens payoff. Now I want to remark two things here. So first, um, this payoff is the same for all citizens. So whereas citizens in, in this model are producing local evidence that is not the same, so there is, uh, they, they have different access to, to local evidence, they share the same common interest about the policy, so their expected payoff is the, it takes the same form. The second thing that I want to remark is that in blue here, I have the key difference between the citizens payoff and the policymakers payoff. And I'll come back to that in a moment in terms of the misalignment between these two players. Now, the citizens expected payoff uh, is strictly quasi convex in informativeness um, with a minimum at, uh, at either zero, in which case it would be, be strictly increasing in informativeness or something that's positive. Um, what this tells us at the moment is that whereas the policymaker's pol uh, uh, payoff was strictly increasing in informativeness, the citizen's payoff need not be so. So what that means is that the citizen will not necessarily prefer to contribute to higher informativeness by becoming active. Okay. 
Now let's uh, let's look at this in a picture. So here I, I'm depicting the payoff of the citizen, which is strictly quasi-convex, assuming that uh, that uh, payoff uh, minimizing the informativeness level is strictly positive. So the payoff of the citizen is first decreasing in informativeness and uh, and, and then increasing. Now um, the informativeness that a citizen can attain by becoming active in a mini public m hat uh, is simply this sigma squared of m hat. If on the other hand, the citizen remains passive, uh, she will be able to induce sigma squared of m hat minus herself. So this is the margin uh, uh, on which she can actually influence informativeness. By becoming active, she can bring informativeness from sigma squared m hat minus herself to sigma squared m hat. So we'll think of this difference as the marginal informativeness of citizen I. Now, looking at the picture here, so let's suppose that these two uh, informativenesses, the, the active and the passive, are to the left of the payoff minimizing informativeness. Um, in this particular instance that I'm showing here, the citizen actually does not want to become active because her payoff goes down by becoming active. So this is helpful to us because we can write down the evidence discovery constraint, which actually says that the, uh, the citizen prefers active informativeness to the passive informativeness, so uh, he strictly prefers to be active. Can I ask you here yes. a question? I think Miltos already asked it, a similar question in the chat about um, citizens who choose not to participate. In the model that you presented so far, if you are called to serve in a mini public, you have to call, but you may choose to be passive. Yes. But uh, we could also reinterpret that as uh, just not responding to the invitation and letting someone else to take your place. Absolutely. And that's, that's an alternative interpretation. Um, as long as the citizens know who else will be in that mini public, uh, then, then that's perfectly fine, right? Uh, and in a moment, I'll be able to say something about uh, whether the, the mini public that emerges in equilibrium is deterministic or random. Um, and as long as it's deterministic, everyone knows who else will be in that mini public. Uh, so you could reinterpret this as the citizen uh, choosing to self-select uh, themselves out of the mini public. Uh, so why does the citizen... Um, have a strictly quasi-convex payoff in this setup. Well, the, the becoming active has two potentially counteracting effects for the citizen. On the one hand, more information is better in the sense that it might generate a more uh, informative uh, uh, adoption, a more a better informed adoption decision. So uh, it, it will lead to a more precise estimate of the, of the policy value. But on the downside, uh, information might be misused by the policymaker. Higher informativeness might increase the probability of exposed misalignment between the policymaker and the citizens. And in particular, when I say exposed uh, misalignment, I have in mind the cases in which the post mini, mini public value is in such regions in which uh, the policymaker and the, and the uh, citizens would take different decisions if they were to reach such, such a post mini public value. So if we were to write the, the payoffs of the citizens in terms of the uh, uh, policymakers payoff here, the only wedge between these two players is, as I said, the threshold of adoption C. So uh, the, uh, the citizen has to take into account the fact that policymaker will choose, will, will follow a threshold of adoption uh, that might not be zero exposed. And that is accounted into, into this uh, term. So the, uh, uh, the uh, citizen will take into account the fact that there is an expectation that he needs to form over the threshold of adoption based on which the policymaker will be making the adoption decision. So this leads us to a misalignment term between the policymaker and the citizens. Uh, and the, essentially the rest of the talk will be sort of studying this misalignment term and how it varies across the parameters of our model. Um, when does the misuse of information in this setup dominate the citizen's calculus? So I've already shown this to you in a picture, but let me put it together now in terms of conditions. So the, uh, the misuse of information will become the dominant force if first there is a region in which the citizen's payoff is decreasing. 
So there is a region. Uh, so that's to say that the, 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 uh, at the start here, at information, uh, at zero amount of information, the uh, citizen will have a negative marginal value of information. Uh, so even small amounts of information will harm the citizen. And secondly, uh, we need the active informativeness and the passive informativeness to be sufficiently to the left of the payoff minimizing uh, yeah, informativeness level. Uh, we interpret this as uh, the mini public being sufficiently uninformative. Uh, so uh, both of these conditions need to hold in order for us to see citizens who are passive in equilibrium. Uh, we refer to these two conditions in tandem as the curse of too little information because a citizen wants to be passive only if the informativeness uh, of the, uh, of the uh, mini public is sufficiently small and there is a negative marginal value of, of uh, small amounts of information. Um, to put this all together, what this means for equilibrium. So we will be focusing on policymaker preferred um, perfect Bayesian equilibrium in this setup. Um, and within this class, we are able to say that it's without loss to restrict attention to no randomization over mini publics. So the mini public that will be chosen will be a deterministic one. Uh, this hinges on the assumption that the uh, uh, citizens here are uh, observing who else is in the mini public. So there is no value of randomization uh, from the policymaker's perspective uh, as uh, randomization is a tool to, to induce more participation into the mini public. Secondly, um, oh, it's without loss to focus on pure strategies at the evidence discovery stage. So all citizens in our mini public are either active with probability one or passive with probability one. And lastly, there will be no passive citizens in the mini public in equilibrium. Uh, passive citizens, of course, do not contribute to informativeness, uh, but perhaps more importantly, they are also not uh, uh, important in uh, encouraging more evidence discovery by the others in the mini public. So they have no role in the optimal mini public and it's without loss to, to ignore them. So we can write the policymakers mini public choice problem as a problem of maximizing informativeness of the mini public subject to all citizens in the mini public being active. This is a very simple form because we are able to uh, tractably compute the informativeness of the mini public. And we are able to study these constraints uh, and, to, and to say something about the, the form of the optimal mini public. Now I'll be brief about the first best mini public. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the uh, leaving evidence discovery constraints aside, we want to know what is the, the mini public that will be chosen. Now that I've simplified the policymakers problem, I know that the correct notion of a first best mini public is one that maximizes informativeness. So the solution to the unconstrained problem uh, will be the first best mini public. Um, the, this mini public is the mini public that maximizes the welfare of both the policymaker and the citizens in the absence of political uncertainty. So it's, it's a, the sort of the right notion of, of how diverse should a mini public be when evidence constraints are not present. Uh, let me give you a picture uh, in terms of the first best uh, mini public here. So this is a characterization that's coming from, uh, from another paper uh, of mine. Uh, the uh, first best mini, mini public will be of the, of the following forms. I, I uh, uh, invite you to look at the picture in the bottom here. So the first best mini public will be symmetric around the median citizen. Uh, so uh, the uh, showing here, I have a mini public that's sufficiently large to give you an idea. The distance of the first uh, uh, of the first citizen uh, from zero will be the same as the distance of the rightmost citizen from from one. Uh, it will also be such that there is equal distance between any two adjacent mini public citizens. So once we fix the first and the last citizen in the mini public, all mini all citizens. Uh, in between will have equal distance from each other. And the peripheral citizens can be pinned down by a very simple equation. Okay, so this mini public is setting the correct notion of how diverse mini public should be. And we should be comparing the optimal mini public to this mini public. Uh, let me skip for now who is passive in the first best mini public in order to, to address uh, the, the form that the optimal mini public takes. No, so first, so in this setup, there are two instruments that the policymaker can use. The policymaker can distort the size of the mini public 
uh, she can choose to invite fewer citizens in the mini public than n, or uh, she can choose to distort the composition of the citizens within the mini public. She can choose citizens who are different from those who would be chosen in the first best mini public. Now, uh, the first question that I want to address here is does the policymaker ever use the, the first distortion? Uh, does she ever sample fewer citizens than what the capacity allows? Given capacity n, the optimal mini public here will be either empty in the sense that no mini public can be incentivized to discover evidence or will consist of exactly and distinct citizens. So what this proposition says is that we will never see intermediate distortions in mini public size. Either it's the case that we cannot incentivize any evidence discovery or we'll, uh, the policymaker will use the entire mini public capacity. And uh, the intuition for this is quite simple. So let's start with, by contradiction, let's suppose that there is a mini optimal mini public that is, um, that is uh, active in which all citizens are active. Uh, and let's think about adding a new citizen to this mini public and understand how the evidence constraints change. So, um, by M here, I am denoting the original mini public. So all citizens in the original mini public want to be active. Um, now let's add a new citizen, uh, J. Now J is uh, of course uh, willing to be active because J is uh, sending informativeness from the previous level to a suddenly higher level. So that's to say the, uh, the incentive constraint of the, the evidence discovery constraint of the newly added citizen will not be problematic. Now let's look at the original citizens in, in this setup. So uh, if those citizens were already active, that means that the configuration uh, is exactly the one that I'm showing you here. Um, if we were to add a new citizen, their passive informativeness and their active informativeness would increase. Uh, but of course, uh, shifting both of these to the right in such a way that that citizen was willing to be active before implies that this citizen will want to be active afterwards as well. So uh, visually, both of these uh, passive and active informativeness are being shifted to the right. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, we're going to a lower level of passive informativeness and a strictly higher level of informativeness. So the, the citizen will prefer to be active. Uh, what this proposition tells us is that uh, the optimal mini public can take uh, one of three forms now that we have ruled out the possibility that the optimal mini public has fewer citizens than n but strictly positive number of citizens either the optimal mini public will uh, coincide with the first best mini public or in case it's distorted it can be of either empty so no mini public can be incentivized to any extent or it will consist of exactly n distinct citizens, some of which will not be the first best uh, mini public citizens. So we call two and three here as distortions. Uh, and we want to understand to, uh, in, in what circumstances we are uh, able to get a distorted mini public. So some evidence at least will be produced in this, in this optimal mini public versus case three, which is uh, a case in which the, the mini public choice will collapse uh, because uh, there will be no citizens who are willing to be active in any mini public. So in terms of uh, what I want to do next, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, how political uncertainty and mini public capacity uh, affect the ability of the policymaker to be in case two versus case three, to be able to, to uh, incentivize some uh, 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 citizens in a distorted mini public to discover evidence. Okay, so um, the, uh, when we're thinking about uh, greater political uncertainty, there is a question about whether uh, this should imply uh, stronger or weaker incentives uh, to, uh, uh, for evidence discovery. Uh, because greater political uncertainty implies that the threshold of the policymaker is harder to predict uh, ex ante. You might think that um, the uh, agency loss is greater when political uncertainty is greater, and this will imply that uh, evidence uh, discovery will, will, will be harder to incentivize. Uh, what we show is that political uncertainty impact has a non-monotonic effect on the optimal mini public. So either when, mini, either when uh, the, the uncertainty is too high or too low, 
the optimal mini public will be exactly the first best mini public. So the curse of too little information will disappear for, for extreme values of, of political uncertainty. So it's moderate political uncertainty what, what, actually, uh, uh, what actually leads to distortions in the optimal mini public. So the statement is that um, there will exist cutoffs in terms of political uncertainty such that the optimal mini public will be the first best mini public if either uncertainty is above, uh, uh, is below, is sufficiently low, so it's below the uh, lower threshold, or is sufficiently high, so it's uh, above the, the higher threshold. Now, let me give you a bit of intuition for why this is the case. Uh, political uncertainty determines the uh, level of informativeness of the mini public that minimizes the payoff of the citizens. So in the strictly quasi-convex payoffs that I've been showing you, uh, the uh, optimal, uh, the, the level of the payoff minimizing uh, informativeness will depend on tau. Mathematically, as tau is going to either zero or plus infinity, this, uh, uh, this uh, sigma underline is going to, to, to zero. So what we have here is uh, this level of informativeness moving to, to, the, to the left and the uh, payoff of the citizens becoming almost globally increasing in informativeness for all levels of informativeness. So uh, this of course implies that in any mini public uh, any citizen will be willing to be active. So this is sort of the, the mathematical interpretation of what we, we're doing here. The argument is a bit more convoluted because we have to show that even though this is going to zero, it's going to zero in such a way that the payoff at zero is not shooting up too high, but, uh, but ultimately this is the driving force mathematically. The economic intuition though is quite different in either of these polar cases. So, as far as low uncertainty goes, as political uncertainty is vanishing, the policymaker is preferring uh, the, the uh, same adoption decision as the citizens exposed. And that's because the threshold is being drawn from a distribution that's very close to zero. So they are very likely to, to be aligned exposed. So misalignment will vanish between the two. Uh, and what this says is that the value of a more accurate adoption decision will dominate the citizens' calculus. There is uh, the, the agency loss is really small in this in this case. So the intuition for low uncertainty, I think, is the more perhaps the more intuitive one. On the other hand, for high uncertainty, uh, is the opposite case. Political uncertainty becomes arbitrarily large. Um, and uh, and the uh, and it's very hard to predict the policymaker's threshold and their this and uh, her decision based on uh, the given evidence. In fact, as uh, political uncertainty is going to plus infinity, the policymaker's decision is fully unpredictable, and the probability of adoption goes to one half. Okay, so we're here in a situation in which the citizen cannot affect the probability of exposed min misalignment. And uh, because she cannot affect that probability of exposed misalignment sufficiently, on the margin, she prefers to give a bit more information just for the value of information that that entails. So um, putting all of these two intuitions together, what this means is that for, uh, for political, uh, 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 let me see. So you see the correct slide here about moderate political uncertainty. Okay, so as far as moderate, uh, uh, so, Putting all of, both of these two economic intuitions together, for a citizen to want to remain passive, two conditions need to hold. Uh, the exposed misalignment should be sufficiently likely. And moreover, the citizen should be able to significantly influence the probability of exposed misalignment. So in the case of low uncertainty, uh, exposed misalignment was sufficiently unlikely, so the citizen wanted to be active. In the case of high uncertainty, uh, misalignment was very likely, but the citizen could hardly influence the, the probability of such misalignment. So on the margin, the value of information dominated. So under pol uh, moderate political uncertainty, both of these conditions are met. And that's why the, uh, the citizen might want to remain, remain passive under, uh, under such uncertainty. Um, now, let me turn to the question of how do the uh, evidence discovery constraints vary with the mini public size? We show that um, as the mini public capacity becomes arbitrarily large, the optimal mini public uh, will uh, become the first best mini public or the empty one. So that's to say, if it is at all possible 
to use uh, mini publics to evaluate a policy, then with sufficiently large capacity, we should be seeing the first desk mini public become active. Otherwise, if the policy is sufficiently uncertain ex ante, so that no mini public can ever be incentivized to, to uh, evaluate the policy, then even very large mini public capacity uh, should, should uh, still won't, won't, won't be useful to the policymaker. So the takeaway from, from, uh, from this result that I explained to you briefly is that distortions are more likely to arise in, um, uh, in, in smaller mini publics. Um, in perhaps one uh, minute uh, that I have left, I will uh, try to, to convey to you the, uh, the uh, uh, intuition for why the optimal mini public is not sufficiently diverse. So um, let me give you the intuition for two citizens. So we show that in the optimal mini public with two citizens, the two citizens in the mini public have to be closer to the median citizen than the first best mini public. And the intuition for this is coming from the single, uh, from the strict quasi-convexity of the, of the payoff uh, function here. Uh, the, uh, in order for uh, citizens to be incentivized to provide their evidence, they need to have lower marginal informativeness than what they have in the first best mini public that is, uh, that is passive. Uh, so that's to say, uh, if we start with a mini public that is passive, we need to make both uh, we, we need to make both citizens such that they their marginal informativeness is smaller in the mini public, so that they are willing to become active within this dip of the quasi convex payoff. What this implies for two citizens is that they need to become to come closer to each other, uh, and as a result, uh, they they uh, they will be willing to provide their evidence because their evidence is uh, not too novel. So it's not likely to be too surprising to the policymaker, and it's not likely to to increase the probability of exposed misalignment. Um, the intuition for larger n, so n greater than two, formalizes in the notion of informational uh, diversity. So we show that the uh, citizens in our mini public, uh, in order to incentivize evidence discovery, we need those citizens to have sufficiently small marginal informativeness. Coming back to Steve questions, uh, Steve's question about the, the Ornstein Nudenbeck process, the exponential form here makes it tricky to sort of translate the uh, result that we have that's general about informational diversity to demographic diversity for, for larger mini publics. So, so this is sort of the limit or, or the boundary of, of our understanding of demographic diversity. Um, I will uh, leave up a slide that, uh, that I prepared on, on sort of why this is an important question and, uh, and I'm happy to continue the discussion uh, about the, uh, the takeaways uh, from, from these results. Uh, thank you so much and sorry for going a bit over time. Thank you very much, Ariada, for this very nice talk. So it is time now that we move to the Q&A section. So panelists can, can, can start if they have a comment, question, clarification. Perhaps we can start with Stephen if he, if he likes. If he's there. And then we'll leave the lockout for the end. All right, great. Thanks, Arata. That's very interesting. Uh, so I have lots of questions, but let me start by asking a question about this sort of uh, curse of too small of information. So if, if I understand correctly, there's a sort of coordination problem amongst the, the citizens here. They all provide their information and they make them collectively worse off. If this was one large citizen, she wouldn't provide the information to the, to the policymaker. That's right. If we're uh, so in this sort of negative zone. Right. So, uh, in, in, so, Condition. So I specified that we're looking here at policymaker preferred uh, PBEs, right? So we are looking at sort of the maximal, uh, uh, the ma maximally informative mini public. Mm -hmm. um, once we are there, the, the intuition is that the uh, uh, the passive informativeness. I'm, I'm trying to scroll back here to to a picture uh, of the of the uh, curse of information so that I can. Um, 
perhaps this is. So uh, the curse of information here is, you know, passive informativeness being too low relative to the payoff minimizing level of informativeness and the active informativeness also being too low compared to that level of informativeness. Um, the, as far as coordination goes, of course, the citizens could coordinate in less informative mini publics, uh, mi uh, in less informative equilibria as well, but we are looking at the policymaker preferred one, so the one that maximizes the informativeness. So with that specification, yes, there is an element of coordination here in the sense that you, uh, each citizen takes passive informativeness as given and just thinks about how marginally informative uh, he is relative to the passive informativeness. Yeah, great. So that's sort of a very interesting result. It's collectively we make ourselves worse off by all providing the information, but it still satisfies individual rationality, conditional on everyone else in my group providing the information I'm willing to provide mine. Uh, and so I'm interested in this, then the implications for design. So if I was a boss, I should walk around the office and ask everyone individually, kind of tell them everyone else is telling me your information. So you, can you share, you should share your information and so everyone's willing to share. So I'm sort of interested in that design. And then what then becomes interesting is what you were getting into in, in your later results about what's the optimal design of that mini public. And so what it's sort of telling me, I need to, I don't want diversity of opinion here. I want to suppress them together. Is that right? I want a homogeneous workforce so that everyone's small enough that it's valuable. Yes, so that's, uh... Um, that, that's exactly right. So the outcomes of the mini public citizens that will be selected into the optimal mini public are too correlated, right? So you might want to also interpret this as an echo chamber. The the uh, in terms of sort of the the, the uh, information that the two citizens bring into the mini public is sort of overlapping uh, by too much. All right, great. So is the public forum then the optimal structure for one of these mini publics? Would the policymaker be worried that they could? The voters could then collude, the citizens could collude and not provide that information? So that's an interesting question. Uh, the, um, so the mini public design part of our results is saying that um, we, sh we should be focusing on designing a mini public uh, with the assumption that they will coordinate on the maximally informative uh, the maximally informative uh, equilibrium. So in that sense, we are giving the best chance to, to, uh, to evidence the discovery and trying to sort of maximize that, uh, giving the, the, the policymaker his most preferred equilibrium. Um, of course, in public forum, I guess you are, you, there is a component perhaps of learning which equilibrium we're playing that, uh, that you're thinking of, uh, which here we sort of, uh, uh, following the, the tradition of focusing on policymaker preferred equilibria, you know, in, information design and mechanism design, we're sort of leaving on the side. Uh, but um, we, we think of it as, as uh, the, uh, as far as the public forum is a forum in which you observe who else is in that mini public, then the, our, uh, you know, the result that we have that focusing on deterministic mini, mini publics is, uh, is, is without loss and focusing on, on pure strategies uh, in evidence discovery is without loss, then it seems to us that the optimal mini public that we identify here um, is, uh, of, sufficient, is of, of low diversity, even though we're giving the best chance to the equilibrium that we're selecting out of that. Uh, so not accounting for you know, coordination failures that might settle us into a less informative equilibrium. Yeah, I think you did the right thing, but this is the Q and A, so I can ask about other equilibria. Anyway, let me stop, Max. So it's, it's, Max. it's a short answer. We, we I haven't looked at other equilibria uh, and haven't sort of taken into account the coordination failures beyond well, the one that- Yeah, well, that's what's nice. You show me many publics, we get to understand how the information aggregation works and it makes me understand where the weak points are in that institution or where the sort of challenges in making these mini publics work. And what your result has shown to me is that it's this sort of, curse of small information tells me that it's there's this coordination uh, imp the, the importance of coordination amongst the the citizens in willingness to share their information yes and i think you know one takeaway at least that we learned from this project is that you know it's it's really worth to to uh invest in uh sort of larger capacities so uh smaller smaller uh, mini publics will perhaps 
uh, contrary to our intuitions that we have from, from rational ignorance literature, small mini publics will, uh, uh, will not acquire evidence, even if evidence is costless is in our models. So uh, the intuition here is a bit uh, different from, from the one that we have uh, from the rational ignorance literature. And we think this is, this is highlighting a new force in that sense. Yeah, that's very nice. Max and the others ask a question now. Go for it. I have questions, but uh, maybe there are other people who want uh, to join in as well. If yes, so, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, you, you had a slide on n number of participants. Is it also correct? Did I catch it correctly that it's also non-monotonic? So what the, your last sentence that you just said that you know smaller might be not better. Well, if if n is one, then there is no uh, distortion. Okay, there is a median voter, uh, and they they don't distort the composition of the of the of the one size mini public. So that's uh, so n equal to one would be something like the citizen is going from informativeness equal to zero to informativeness equal to the informativeness of the median citizen here. If we are to the left of this, uh, of this uh, dip here, then the, uh, uh, the, even that singleton mini public might be passive, right? So they would uh, be passive, that's the, that's the distortion. Right, yes. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. No, 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 that's all right. That's all right. I, I, I had just one, uh, you know, once we open this question of designed, of design, and obviously, you know, the mini public, is, the way, the way, the one that you present is the, um, the advisory one. And obviously, we can have the whole spectrum of possible other possibilities. Um, it's not a, the, the one that is the decision that I'm thinking about, but, but the one that could formulate a recommendation, some kind of Bayesian persuader type of thing, um, and manipulate, you know, still is the decision maker exists who has an ultimate power, it's a principle, but yes. um, is that... Uh, yeah. Right, so so uh, you're thinking about perhaps some scoring function, right, that takes these this evidence into account and translates it into a into a recommendation about how uh, about whether whether to adopt or not, what the right decision is. Is that yeah? So 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 uh, this coordination problem, you know, if they s sat together and only issued a recommendation or not as a function of what they observed. Yes. Okay, and that's what the, that's the only thing that gets to the, the decision maker because in your case, all the evidence gets there. No. Yes. Let, absolutely. Think. Yes, no, that's, that's a great question. So the, the question of, um, I'll, I'll tell you, we've looked a little bit into the question of transparency, uh, but we have not opened the full box of transparency uh, sort of issues. Um, uh, I, I see your question as saying something like, uh, if, the, if what I observe is perhaps not as transparent, either I, can, um, uh, either I can report it in binary form, or perhaps I report it fully uh, to the mini public, but the mini public translates it into a into just a, an action recommendation to the uh, to the policymaker, could this perhaps uh, incentivize more uh, more? Uh, they have common interest after all inside the public. You're absolutely right. So uh, our prior on the question of transparency, even at the simpler form that I'm about to tell you now, is that was that uh, perhaps transparency is uh, is. Uh, given that evidence is costless and transparent here, perhaps that will stack the deck uh, in favor of evidence discovery. Now, what we have, uh, we have not looked at the question that you, that you suggest, you know, sort of uh, thinking of more aggregate ways uh, of, of uh, uh, showing your outcome, of, of communicating your outcome, but we've looked a little bit at evidence disclosure, which is another form of transparency. Um, so, um, the, in the baseline model, we're assuming that you discover your evidence and then your evidence becomes perfectly observed, observable to the rest of the mean public and the policymaker. Uh, one way to, to sort of uh, uh, remove commitment would be to say that the citizen uh, discovers their evidence and then decides whether to disclose that outcome uh, or not. Uh, uh, and when I say or not, I mean you either disclose your true outcome or you remain silent. So it's a hard evidence setup as in Milgram and Roberts here. And what we show is that for any fixed mini public in our commitment game, in our baseline game, uh, 
in the no commitment game, there will, will exist an equilibrium in which everyone in the mini public discovers evidence and everyone discloses uh, uh, truthfully, or at least uh, let me state this more carefully, the policymaker will infer all outcomes in equilibrium. There is a single outcome level in which the, uh, each citizen remains silent and otherwise uh, he perfectly discloses uh, his outcome. And so in this sense, what this is telling us is that as long as you worry about perhaps uh, uh, equilibria uh, in this disclosure game uh, being such that uh, a perfectly informative equilibrium does not exist, you should not worry about it because uh, for any fixed mini public that we that we can take with in our game, there exists an equilibrium in this disclosure game that uh, that is such that all outcomes it's as if all outcomes were observable. Um, but we have not opened the box of all equilibria of this disclosure game, and of course we haven't looked at other sort of relaxations of transparency, which I think would be very important uh, in uh, in terms of understanding whether transparency here might be. Uh, might be discouraging evidence discovery. So, thanks. I mean, it's already 15 past, okay? So, uh, but I see that the debate is quite active. So probably, I mean, we can continue the debate after declaring uh, uh, the end of the official part of the seminar. So just to conclude, I mean, Thank you, Arjada. Thank you, Nina. And thank you, Stephen, for joining us today. So, I mean, it has been a pleasure and a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for coming.